I'm Dave Baker. And I'm Spandrew Spice. Welcome to Deep Cuts, the podcast where we pick a topic and walk you through the ins, the outs, and the nitty gritty so you can appear like an interesting and idiosyncratic person at your next forced social function. Today's topic is... The Phantom. Who is The Phantom? He's arguably the first North American comic strip superhero. Created by writer and theater director Lee Falk, The Phantom has been adapted into countless TV shows, films, serials, comics, and merchandise. However, there's a dark secret lurking at the heart of the ghost who walks. Act 1, Seeing in the Dark with No Pupils. The Phantom was first published on February 17th, 1936. The now long-running strip, still running in parts of the world today, was originally a newspaper daily strip. It was published seven days a week through King Features Syndicate. In 1939, the strip was upgraded to feature a color strip on Sundays. Both are still running as of 2022. At its peak, The Phantom was read by over 100 million people daily. Created by Lee Falk and written by him until his death in 1999, the character has been drawn by a legion of talented artists. Cy Berry, Ray Moore, Wilson McCoy, Keith Williams, and many, many more. The character of the Phantom set many of the tropes currently enjoyed or subverted by the superhero genre. He was the first fully spandex-clad superhero, the first to wear a domino mask with white eyes, the first to be a part of a dynastic legacy of crime fighters. After Lee Falk's runaway success with Mandrake the Magician, another pulp-inspired, magic-themed crime fighter, King Features asked Falk to develop another character for them. Initially, Falk wanted to create a strip about King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. However, that idea was rejected by King Features. Falk developed the Phantom next. He took the cocktail of Tarzan and Zorro and pulp adventurers like Alan Quartermain and mixed them all up to create the Guardian of the Eastern Dark. Today, we know the Phantom is Kit Walker Jr., the 21st descendant of a man named Christopher Walker, who is marooned on a deserted island by pirates, calling themselves the Singh Brotherhood. This man was then saved by a tribe of indigenous peoples in the fictional African nation of Bengala. After learning their ways, Christopher swore an oath on the skull of his father to defend the weak and helpless and seek out piracy wherever it reared its ugly head. Smash cut to the 1930s, and we follow the adventures of his great, 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 great descendant as he continues this holy war on crime. However, this wasn't always the plan. The original character that would don the Phantom Mask was to be named Jimmy Wells, a standard playboy by day, crime fighter by night idea. However, that ended up being abandoned. In fact, much of the Phantom was almost very different. The character was originally intended to be gray, but due to a printing malfunction ended up as purple, and his name was almost originally the Grey Ghost, because Falk thought that the Phantom name was too close to the Phantom of the Opera and the Phantom Detective. All right, Spandrew, what is your first exposure to this guy that we're talking about here today? The Phantoms, the big fans, as they say. Little Lloyd Fance Leroy. You, you could have just stopped at the first one. No, you don't, you don't, you don't like Little Lord Fance Leroy? That was the other name. That, that was, uh, he was like, it was going to be Little Lord Fantleroy, but then I was just like, no, that doesn't work, because in order for that to even make sense, you have to know that his name was going to be the Phantom, and that's just, I don't want to have to draw an in, write an intro that just explains that every time, so let's just call him the Phantom. Um, yeah, uh, I, I feel like we've had a similar conversation before with some of these old pulp characters, um, but I, but I feel like we have a similar affinity for old pulp characters. Um, you're ob- you're way you're much more into it than I am, but we have a similar affinity of them. However, uh, I feel like I discovered all of them in a very different way than you did. Um, and I think, funny enough, I think the, my first exposure to the Phantom, and I actually I, I think this was mentioned in a previous episode, but it was seeing a Phantom action figure in an issue of wizard magazine and it was it was just it was something in you know in an issue of wizard magazine that i got from a video store that was talking about this specific phantom action figure 
and I don't even remember what it was saying about it. It might have just been a review or something like that. But I just remember thinking that it was a cool look. Like it was just like, and I didn't really know what it was. It was just like, oh, what what is this character? Like, it I just never seen it before, and it was just mystifying to me. And I didn't know if it was a comic book character or what. Um, and then after that, my first real exposure to it was the was the movie, which we'll talk about later. But I saw the Phantom movie in the '90s with Billy Zane, and um, we're going to talk about this much more later. But at that time, there was this weird boom in like old 1920s through 40s pulp characters being adapted into movies because of Batman. Um, and so we had the Shadow and the Phantom, and I just really kind of resonated with these weird movies the that that just like to me somebody who was not familiar with these characters at all and they just kind of seemingly came out of nowhere it was just something that it was something different than everything else that was that was coming out um and i was just i was mystified by the intangible quality of these characters that they didn't feel like something that was like based on some very familiar ip to me it wasn't like oh this is batman i know what batman is i've seen the batman cartoon I've, I have all the action figures. This is like very well-worn territory or even, or like the Ninja Turtles or anything, things that I love. But like, this was just like, this had this quality of like mysterious, like what is this kind of, kind of thing to me. Um, and then that kind of led to me like becoming interested in these characters and uh, looking, you know, listening to old uh, radio, uh, the, the old radio serials of some of these characters uh, that I was able to find on CD and stuff like that. Yeah, my I actually don't know what my first interaction with the Phantom was. Um, like, I don't have a crystal clear memory of, like, seeing him in Wizard Magazine or whatever. He kind of is one of those things, like Spider-Man, where it's like it, he's just kind of always been around. Just because I'm, I've been interested in this stuff. Um, like, I I remember listening to the, the Shadow radio serial, like, religiously. Um and through the shadow, I kind of like learned about the Phantom, Doc Savage, um, the Spider, who's another less popular now, but in his day, equally popular character. Um, but I think people don't like the Spider as much because he has dorky hair. He has like, he basically just looks like the shadow, but he has a fucking like Jerry curl, like long curly hair out the back of his like costume, which is really weird you know he's got like the slouch hat that the, the the shadow has he's got the um uh long black trench coaty type thing and he also has two rings and two guns so he's like a mixture of the phantom and the the shadow where the shadow is like he turns invisible and he laughs and he has two guns <laughs> and the the phantom he's got two guns and people think that he can turn invisible and he's got two rings that he punches people with <laughs> And the spider, he's a guy, and he's got two guns. He doesn't turn invisible, but he's got two rings, and he punches people. Yeah! Like, they all, like, I I like the kind of, like, everybody cannibalizing each other with those ideas at that time, and how everybody is really, like, almost you can feel like there's an arms race for superheroes at the end of the pulp era and the beginning of the comics in the 30s and 40s, where everybody's just like, fuck it, um, horseman, um, uh, scorpion man. Um, Spider Man, fuck it, just throw everything against the wall, you know? Yeah, that actually, that actually leads really nicely into a question that I was going to ask you, sort of a hypothetical, but um, and maybe, maybe you're maybe the answer to this is like obvious, and I'm it's not even like debatable, but uh, I was going to ask because I feel like this is a very specific time in pop culture where it's kind of the Wild West, um, where these there, you know, there are these new forms of technology um, that are expanding the ways in which uh, pop culture can be created and distributed to people. And so it's 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 this it's a wild west where there really hasn't there there's not a, there's not a lot of stuff that has been made in the mediums of comics and radio serials and you know early movies uh you know film films for the theater and so it's almost this like you're saying it's almost this thing where you can just kind of say like a uh, horse monster and then that's just you could just like turn that into a real thing and have like every little boy in 
the country like wanting to you know, you know dress as horse monster for Halloween or whatever versus today where because of the how long these mediums have existed and the oversaturation of content especially in the digital age in order to sort of like number one be unique and number two like get anybody to pay attention to what you're making you have to create these like really these like remixes of remixes with like a postmodern twist and every every you know the 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 concept of being original now is a completely different thing it's all about like how can you take existing aspects of the things that inspired you and like mix them together and like add little like unique twists on them that make them uniquely yours in a world where like nothing is unique anymore and i guess and, and uh, they both have their they both have their like allures right like I, I, the idea that you have to like be really unique and come up with these like really kind of like uh postmodern ideas in order to stand out is like a is like a cool and interesting challenge and i think that it leads to some really interesting art um, as, as a result of that process, but then, you know, to create these sort of like formative works and these formative ideas where, you know, these characters that persevere for generations because of their simplicity, um, is also another thing that is like a really cool idea. So I guess I was going to ask you like, what, what, which of those two things, if, if you had the choice, which sort of era would you want to live in? Would you want to just keep bla trailblazing in the year 2022? Or would you want to go back and like get to create your own phantom? Yeah, I don't I don't know that I would want to go. I mean, it's still it's still hard today for creators to own their work and maintain control. Well, but uh, it was it was that all, that, all, that all aside, though, like I'm not talking about like how shitty deals were or like, as we'll talk about later, some of the inherent racism in these works. I'm just talking about the the concept of having sort of like infinite possibilities of what you could do uh creatively um versus like needing to tap into that infinite possibility of things you can do in order to stand out yeah um i think i'm I, yeah i don't think i have a particularly strong nostalgia of like man i just wish there if i could have been at the start i could have thought of killer frost you know like i don't i don't necessarily think about it that way um i kind of feel like that's how it is now i feel like especially in the medium of comics like most mediums have been around for a hundred years that are consumed in popular culture. Like film really has been around for longer, but it's really just a hundred years. And look how many amazing things have been made in that hundred years. Whereas comics basically started in the thirties by the fifties in America, they were just completely stifled and shut down and censored and fucked due to the Wortham hearing Wortham hearings and the, um, 10 cent plague, uh, you know, mass comic book burnings. Um, so I, in North America, comics basically, in my opinion, are that still. That's one of the things I'm so excited about is that there's such an infinite canvas and it's such a, a, a wonderful um, kind of divergence from everything else in popular culture where you can still have an idea that is completely unique and different and unlike anything else um, because it is because the medium itself hasn't existed that long. You know, I mean, even though it's literally been around 100 years almost now, it really hasn't It's been around like 30 years at like peak, you know, cultural consumption. You know, it's like the 30s, the 40s. And then it's just fucking face plants until like the 80s where there's a little bit of stuff happening. And then the speculator boom kills that. And now we're finally out of the speculator boom. And there's really interesting, cool stuff happening. So I, I don't know. I personally think of it as like fuck yeah like well, let's let's fuck some shit up let's try some weird stuff let's see where it goes you know um but also you know no thank you <laughs> please don't uh take all my rights like every other cartoonist in history and i've been very fortunate that i live at a time where there's there's a growing movement towards that point of view both from the creator and the publisher community yeah, well, that's interesting, though, because I, I, I was looking at some paperwork in the Mystery Treehouse last night, and I actually saw that um, apparently uh, Andrew, uh, due to some kind of weird agreement, like it, it was in your lease agreement for some reason, but Andrew owned the rights to all of your creative works. And it specifically says in the contract that if in the event of his death, 
all ownership transfers to his successor as the co-host of Deep Cuts. <laughs> yeah, that's that sounds right. That sounds right. So we got here. We got this. Uh, we got this. This Sunday strip drawn by Ray Moore, one of the seminal initial Phantom artists. Some might argue the Phantom's co-creator, uh, and Lee Falk for the Phantom. It's a Sunday strip it's in color. Yeah, so it's the uh, the first panel is the intro. Where it's you know the Phantom by Lee Falk and Ray Moore, the story of the Phantom. Uh, next panel, there's a ship that is on fire. It's partially sinking. Its sail has collapsed, and it says, 400 years ago, a merchant ship was attacked by the dread Singh pirates in the Bay of Bengal." Um, oh, it's being attacked by an, a pirate ship. Man washes aboard a uh, a beach on an island. The sole survivor of the raid was washed up on a remote Bengal so- uh, shore. He had seen his father murdered by the Singh pirates. Um, some potentially racially insensitive indigenous men have gathered around the uh, what is so oh so it's the fan he's standing there over. That his father, uh, f- uh, yeah. friendly oh, f- uh, friendly natives nursed him back to health. One day, he found a body washed up from the sea. That was dressed. That was dressed in his father's clothes. He realized it was his father's murderer. Uh, oh, so the these these indigenous people are standing over a man wearing his father's clothes, and he's kind of standing there looking on. Um, says says a week. What did it say? Nursed back to, one day. This is one day, so this is some sometime later, but he's still dressed exactly the same. He's still wearing these tattered pants, so he never changed. He never... <laughs> um, and then uh, he's standing in front of a fire, and he's holding a skull, and it says, He swore an oath on the skull of his father's murderer. He was the first phantom, and the eldest male of each succeeding generation of his family carried on. Um and he says, I swear to devote my life to the destruction of all forms of piracy, greed, and cruelty. My sons and my sons' sons shall follow me. Um, the next panel, these indigenous people are standing around a fire. One of them says, the ghost who walks. And the other says, can never die. As the unbroken line continued down through the centuries, the Orient believed it was always the same man, a man who could not die. So the legend of immortality grew. The next panel is skull and crossbones moving silently and quickly the phantom is usually known by the sign of the skull his mark which has which he always left behind him and then the final panel is the phantom in his costume with the the uh the body suit with the sort of like head uh whatever you would call that cowl is that a cowl yeah i, I don't know if it was called a cowl if it didn't have like a front part um and then the domino mask and it says, uh, today is always before stalking suddenly, mysteriously, the Phantom works alone. I mean, that's pretty badass. You know, racial, racial overtones aside, which we will spend time talking about in a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and like and like the this is like not that bad. It, I think there's something inherently problematic about just the idea of like, oh, we're going to go to this island and there's just like island people in in like loincloths or whatever but you know they're not like blackface or like minstrel characters or some of the things we've seen in previous episodes like the you know RJ you know Tintin and and uh, Captain Marvel and stuff like that it's tame comparatively at least here at least in this strip as the Phantom grew in popularity he expanded into comic books and received his own serial adaptation directed by B. Reeves Easton and now we're gonna we're gonna watch a little bit of it. Um, it's written by Leslie J. Schwabach, Morgan B. Cox, Victor McLeod, and Sherman Lowe. And the title screen is the two the coolest fucking title screen in the history of serials. And there's a credit for Lee Falk and Ray Moore that says, based on the newspaper feature, The Phantom, created and copyrighted by King Features Syndicate uh, Inc. and something oh and created by leon falk and ray moore so it's good that they got his name wrong in the fucking serial that's cool thanks guys leon falk but it's fucking awesome like basically the the opening credits play over a still image that's like kind of this mysterious smoke covered shot of the phantom's head so there's just like 
really cool like art deco lettering that just like appears as this music plays over a shot of the phantom just standing there like staring out at the audience yeah and this is from this from 1943 the phantom tom tyler plays the phantom guy look at that dude look at that face man that's so cool it's weird too because the guy's like actual like tom tyler's facial proportions are kind of weird like he's got like a low forehead and really long chin b reeves eason directed by chapter one the sign of the skull in these unexplored jungles live the native tribes who for generations have been ruled by a great leader, the phantom, the ghost who walks, the man who never dies, a supreme ruler who throughout the years has taught them to live together in peace and harmony. But one day the peaceful stillness of the jungle is broken by the weird and sinister sound of the native tom-toms that had long been silent. It is a message from the Phantom, telling the leaders of all the tribes to gather together for an important meeting. And soon, at Tonga Village, the home of the Phantom, the chiefs, medicine men, high priests, and witch doctors begin to gather to await the appearance of their leader and counselor. We get a bunch of white people. Great. This is what we want, right? This is what we're here for. A bunch of doctors and shit. Big establishing shot of them walking across a obvious Spanish villa set that has been put a bunch of palm fronds in front of to make it seem like the jungle. Business is picking up. <laughs> I feel a refreshment mood coming on. Let's go into the bar and have a punch. That's an idea. Okay. Have a punch. Yeah, I mean, you know, you get the idea. It's a weird 40s cereal. There's lots of people talking like this, see? And no, we're going to just spend like a bunch of time doing stuff before the Phantom shows up. And then eventually the Phantom will show up and he'll do some punching. Some sort of a native ritual. I don't know much about it. I've only been here a short time myself. A giant... A giant fucking super dope skull throne. A witch doctor character has just thrown something on the ground and a big huge fire plume of smoke has appeared. Oh yeah, now the phantom is sitting on the throne, baby! Chiefs, leaders... Men of wisdom and knowledge, I have called you together because I fear there are forces that will menace your peace and happiness. He's no Billy Zane. There has been no war among any of you. But I have this is also the older Phantom, who's about to die, he's about to get killed, so he's like a grandpa in the Phantom the costume. <laughs> it doesn't really read that cool. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's the, first, the first introduction to him is like, here's this, this like... This dude, this oh, old... Oh, he's just been darted by an assassin. <laughs> he sits down. No, Shiva. Leaders, stay here in Tonga until I return to tell you more. guy put some more something on the ground smoke flies up and the phantom disappears and the next time we see him he's not going to be a grandpa
Master, I saw you stuck by poison dart. Brought juice of tobiana flower. You must drink quickly. No, it's no use. It would only delay the action of the poison for a short time. Moko, go search for man who shoot poison dart. No. That's not important now. Pen and paper. I'm going to send a message to my son. I mean, this is good enough. We can move on. It's a... It's a cereal. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's a... You know, you all know what it is. Yeah, you, you know, uh, racial like issues aside which we'll talk about later i think the the concept is unique and interesting but it's but it's it's interesting that they like conceptualize this story to have like where you know because like you said before like originally the phantom was supposed to be just kind of like a normal like batman character like he's just like a rich dude and then he becomes a crime fighter at night or whatever and it's interesting that they went this route of like saddling him with like He's also just like the emperor of a tribe of indigenous people like that. Like, that's just such a weird choice of like, he's a superhero, but also he's like a diplomatic, uh, like ruler of a nation. Like, that's just that's just such a weird thing, way to go with the story. In a weird wrinkle, Kit Walker had not been introduced in the comics yet, so the phantom actor Tom Tyler played a character named Jeffrey Prescott. Uh, the the This serial, the phantom serial, is considered one of Columbia's best serials. Like, it's really well regarded in the very niche community of people in 2020 who, like, really love serials. Uh, this is considered one of the best. I'm not going to lie. I have not seen it all. I've only seen little bits here and there, but after doing the research for this, I'm like, what am I doing with my life? Why have I not seen this serial? This is amazing. This is super cool. Um, the next time the Phantom was adapted was in the animated TV show Defenders of the Earth, which featured all of the King Feature characters teaming up to defeat Ming the Merciless. Then again in 1994 for the animated The Phantom 2040. I want to play this little uh, clip because The Phantom got so popular that his rights got cut up and put all over the world. So basically, the Phantom in America is one thing, but they also have Phantomet in Norway, and they also have a, I think he's called like Phantomen in uh, Iceland maybe, or Finland. Um, and he's also published in Australia, and basically just like all over the world, the Phantom is still being published to this day. The commercial we're about to watch is a, Norwegian commercial selling Phantom comics in the mid 1980s and it is so fucking cool it's got this really cool kind of like graphic style and the, uh, we're now cutting back and forth between pages from the comic and the animated Phantomet and then an animated shot of the Phantom walking away from us into a fog covered night yeah that, that had the vibe of one of those like just really hyper kinetic dark like drug PSAs from the 1980s yeah 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 it really did arguably though the most important adaptation of the Phantom was released in 1996 the feature film titled The Phantom, starring the one, the only, Billy Zane. Act 2, Billy Zane. Rumors of a big-budget Phantom film had persisted for years. However, nothing had come of it until the iconic Sergio Leone expressed interest in The Phantom during a film interview. Leone was supposed to start writing and was purportedly scouting locations for the film, but it fell apart due to conflicts with Once Upon a Time in America. This is the craziest thing. I was I was to gonna wait I was I was gonna wait for you to do the Joe Dante part, but I was gonna say the exact same thing. Like this blew my mind when I read it. Like as as we're gonna say in a second, like the movie that came out was kind of directed by like a studio company man kind of guy who directed Free Willy. Um, and it's like, it's just a movie of that time. It just feels like a mid-90s uh, attempt at a blockbuster type movie. 
But the fact that Sergio Leone was going to make a Phantom movie, like, that's insane. Like, can you imagine the showdown at the end of the Phantom where it's just like dudes staring at each other, but the main dude doesn't have pupils? I mean, it, yeah, that, it, I mean, it's, it's really just it's like a it's like a Sophie's choice, which you wouldn't know what that meant. But the like the idea of like, oh, we like you ha- it's choose like you either get you can have a Sergio Leone directed Phantom movie, but you have to. But you but then once upon a time in America would never be made. And it's like, which you know, which scenario would you choose? I mean, I think once upon a time in America, the director's cut is one of the best gangster movies of all time. But 10 times out of 10, I would choose The Phantom. Like, <laughs> like, there isn't an alternate dimension where I'm like, yeah, let's keep, let's keep Once Upon a Time. No, Once Upon a Time in the Phantom Land. That's what I, Once Upon a Time in Bengala. That's what I okay, want. So would it be, so do, would it be James Woods as the Phantom? I, I wouldn't have cast him as that, but maybe, I don't know. Clint Eastwood? Would Clint Eastwood be the Phantom? That would be Who's, amazing. Who, yeah, is, who is the we we got we got Billy Zane. We got that old dude from that serial. Who's the dream phantom from any time period? Like during this time period, now, who's the dream phantom? I feel like Gregory Peck would make a really good phantom, like a really good phantom. He's got the hairline, he's got the chin, he's got the intensity, but the phantom's a little bit bulkier and you kind of want somebody who has that physical presence, you know? Yeah, I I th- I think Peck would be my answer. But he's also my answer. Like, honestly, Alec Baldwin would make a really good Phantom. Yeah. I mean, he, well, he was the shadow. He, and he almost was Batman, too. Um, Joe Dante, additionally, was also attached to direct the film at one point in the early 1990s. He developed the script with the screenwriter Jeffrey Bohm. The script was supposedly a bit more of a comedy that featured the Phantom battling, in its finale, a winged demon, which sounds so cool. Like... Ghostbusters the Phantom? That sounds awesome too. Yeah, yeah, they're just they're just like they're just like two sides of the same like holy shit, I wish we had that coin cuz it's like just you can you can a Sergio Leone Phantom movie just writes itself in your head and then like a Joe Dante directed Phantom movie is almost like something that's hard to imagine cuz it's like the tone of what Joe Dante does mixed with this they're like they're two tastes that don't necessarily feel like they would go together, but also kind of maybe they would and they would be fucking amazing. Yeah, I mean, I'd probably choose the Leone one over the two, but just the idea that the finale is the Phantom fighting a fucking like demonic monster. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And it's like it's the it's like the the level of detail and animatronics of that like bat gremlin from Gremlins 2. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. Or it's that uh, so it's that or it's the bat from that deleted Batman forever scene. Honestly, that sounds even better to me. Yeah. He's like kind of slow moving and like weird and like. Meow, meow, meow. I love it. Uh, so we have a quote here from Joe Dante. You want to you want to read this bad boy? Spandrew. I developed the script with the late Jeff Bohm, who wrote Inner Space as kind of a spoof. We were a few weeks away from shooting in Australia when the plug was pulled over the budget and the presence of a winged demon at the climax. A year or so later, it was put back into production, Sans Demon. Only, nobody seemed to notice it was written to be funny, so it was, disastrously, played straight. Many unintentionally funny moments were cut after a raucous test screening, and I foolishly refused money to take my name off the picture, so I'm credited as one of a zillion producers. Here, here, kinda, here's the thing about I don't, this. I don't buy that at all, but I kind of love that idea that, like, that like the reason the the current version of the Phantom, the ninety six Phantom, failed was because they just like didn't know it was supposed to be a comedy. Like that's bullshit. That's not true. But yeah. I love that idea. The thing I was confused about with this quote was it's a little vague. What was the budget pulled out of the movie because of the demon? Because the demon would have been too expensive, or was it because it was like a weird religious thing of like we don't like that there's like a demon in this. No, I think it's just like a tone thing. They were just like, a demon, that's too far. We can't do okay. that. People oh, won't so they like just, that. They just thought it was weird. Okay. I was confused about that. I, was, I didn't know if they were saying, if, the, if he was implying that like it was too expensive to make an animatronic demon or if he meant like there was like an actual like aesthetic issue with it. Ultimately, the job of directing The Phantom would land with Simon Winsor, the director of Free Willy 
and the TV show The Flash, who had been a fan since childhood, purportedly. The film was produced on a budget of $10 million. Uh, all right. Here we go, buddy. We're here. The Phantom. Billy Zane. What was your first interaction with The Phantom? The movie. I mean, just in the movie theater, seeing it. Oh, you saw it in theaters? Yeah. You lucky duck. I saw, I saw, the, I saw the Phantom and The Shadow in theaters. Damn. Uh, Did and, you leave the and, theater of the and spawn? Man, that's a hell of a trinity right there. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I like, yeah, I like the movie. Um, I, I kind of, I kind of thought of it as like, I was like, yeah, this is just kind of like Indiana Jones, except for kind of darker. And the one thing I don't remember much about the movie, the one thing that like, not only does this stick in my mind to this day, but it actually like created a fear. Like this movie had a has a scene that instilled a lifelong fear in me. And it's a scene where there's a a doctor or a scientist that's in their office. And I I forget exactly what it is, is, but there's a character that basically is like, oh, check out this thing in this microscope. And the 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 scientist looks into the microscope and he's like, you know, you got to you got to twist the dials to zoom in on this thing. It's really interesting. You got to see this. And the the doctor twists the little focus knob, but it's like a booby trap. And the the microscope actually the focus knob is uh makes uh a knives shoot out of the eyepiece of the microscope into the scientist's eye, and that create that created a lifelong fear of not wanting to put my eye on a microscope. Understandably, understandably, yeah. And that, the Phantom, that's the main the thing that I remember about that movie out of anything. Like I, <laughs> I, I remember that and like some of the action sequences, but that's about it. The plot of The Phantom centers on the titular Kit Walker Jr. as he has to stop a gangster, a pirate, an evil Indiana Jones, and an aviatrix from combining three skulls and creating a super weapon to take over the world. Or something. The film is a loose adaptation of two stories from Lee Falk's early works, The Sing Brotherhood and The Sky Band. The film was produced due to the success of Batman 1989. Yeah, I mean, so there was a period of time here in the uh, in the early 90s to the mid-90s where The Rocketeer, Dick Tracy, The Shadow, and uh, The Phantom were all put into production off the back of the meteoric rise of Batman 89. And I think it's kind of hard today to understand what a phenomenon that film was. You know, the in the summer of 89, wearing that Bat logo t-shirt was just, like, ubiquitous. Like, you would go to shopping malls and just see, like, dozens of people wearing it. And it it revitalized Batman and took him from being the 1966 joke of, like, Biff Bam Pow into being something completely different and other and objectively cool and it became like a youth movement around that film which yeah i think is it's funny I think because it's, I think it's, it's hard to from, you know yeah I think, I think it's hard to fathom that now especially for people who weren't born i mean even for us right on the cusp of of like being a kid and remembering the time before that but especially for people that were born after that it's kind of hard to fathom that like at the time like you know now it's like oh batman batman's cool batman's a thing that everybody likes but at the time it was literally like this is just some old thing like it was like i mean i'm not saying that's actually true but i'm just saying like i think in most people's minds it's like batman is just some old 1930s thing like like batman as a concept is completely different now after that movie came out yeah and that's kind of what all these studios were hoping would happen with the rocketeer um dick tracy and the shadow and the phantom and specifically dick tracy was like i mean again i I think people don't think of that movie in a particularly high regard and dick tracy is a filmmaking tour de force it is arguably the final matte painting film you know the one that really used matte paintings as an art form um the makeup is arguably the best makeup in that entire decade um, it has the largest star studded cast of anything made in that decade. Like fucking Mumbles. Mumbles is played by an Oscar winner. Like <laughs> big boy Oscar yeah, winner. D- D- Dustin Hoffman in just like thick makeup to where you can't recognize him, which is kind of insane. Yeah, like it's amazing. It is it is a 
it is a striking visual film that is completely uncompromising. And I think it didn't necessarily go down as smooth for people. They were like, this is fucking weird where I watch it and I'm like, this is the greatest fucking thing ever. Well, that whole thing is so funny to me. And you really hit the nail on the head with the thing, this note that you wrote where it's like the, you know, pulp characters was not the lesson to learn from Batman. So funny to me. And if, if you ever want to look at any better example of how producers in Hollywood, like literally just don't know what they're doing. And if you ever think like, Oh yeah, like this huge multi-billion dollar industry, surely these people like, know what they're doing and their decisions are all very calculated. This there's no better example of the fact that they literally don't because the idea that Batman was successful because it was a 1930s pulp character and therefore making more of those would also be successful is the dumbest, most nonsensical idea you could possibly get from that. And yet, I'm so glad it happened because I basically love every one of those movies that was made out of that. But from a financial perspective, it's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It's like it's like a, it's an 11 year old's idea of like a business decision based on the success of Batman. Yeah, completely. And I think the Phantom in terms of like most stylish to most a direct copy of Batman, I feel like it's the sh- the. I feel like it's the shadow is like very similar to the style and tone of the 89 Batman uh, to the degree where they hired the same composer. They have lots of crazy angles. It's got a gothic aesthetic. It's a dark superhero. It's a gritty world. Like the movie opens with the shadow as a warlord. The main character just is introduced as like a murderous psychopath. Yeah, exactly. And so like that, you know, if there's a kind of a, you know, a spectrum, it's like, the the shadow directly adjacent to the to Batman and then the Phantom in the middle where the Phantom is like it's a movie that kind of has some lineage in connection with Batman but it's tonally very different it's a bright pulpy fun adventure and it's not dark in any way like even when they're putting like skulls that can take over the universe together you'd think that would be dark but it's like a it's like cartoony in the way that it's done and then you have Rocketeer kind of slightly to the left of that where it's like wistful for the past but it's still a bright cartoony experience and then on the other end of the spectrum Dick Tracy where it's just fucking bonkers and I love all four of those movies for different reasons yeah it's just Dick Tracy is just like it's just Warren Beatty fucking a pile of money (laughs) yeah pretty fucking much um so you know what's what's good about the Phantom movie is Billy Zane's performance is fantastic. I love, I love, this is such a weird thing to say, but I love Billy Zane's wig in that movie. Like anytime he takes off the cowl and he's just like shredded and walking around the skull cave with like his little like floppy hairdo. I'm like, this is, yeah, it's like, this is the 1940s comic book character, glass jawed hero hair. Oh, it's not glass jaw, square jaw, square jawed. Yeah. I lantern jawed. Yeah, I I love his wig in this movie and it makes me so happy. Sometimes I'll just watch videos of him walking around doing stuff from the movie just to see the wig. Like I love the wig. It is so good. Um and he looks exactly like the Phantom. Like, you know, there's all this urban legend lore of I think, like I think, the you just, Zane. I think you glossed over how truly weird what you just said was. Really? Is that was that why that weird? You sometimes alone by yourself just watch footage of billy zane walking around so you can look at the wig (laughs) that he's wearing it is a little strange i guess that's a truly bizarre thing to say that you just you just kind of like went through and then moved on (laughs) well i guess part of that too is though i kind of do that with a lot of stuff where i'm just like you know you're you're constantly making work and you're trying to output creative stuff and so there's these little kind of like jump start keys You know, of like whenever I need to draw a Halloween boy without his hair, without his helmet on, I just I'm like, all right, let me look at Billy Zane. And they don't actually have the same hairdo. Halloween boy has a giant mohawk, but or like it's like a like a weird mohawk mullet thing. But it's not it's not the same hairdo. But there's just something about the energy of Billy Zane's performance and his weird floppy hair that I just love. Yeah. Billy Billy Zane is just an underrated 
actor. Like he 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 just has not gotten his due. He's that dude. Like he's good at he's good in this. Like Demon Knight, he's great in that. Just as the fucking the sniper movies, yeah, all eight of them. Just the friend of Biff in Back to the Future. Like that, he's just he's another one of those guys like Bob Hoskins. I talked about Bob Hoskins on another episode of just like I just wish why didn't he get more work? Like wish I wish I wish I'd seen him in more stuff. Yeah, I mean, I I think the costume is also really good. Like, I'm really glad they didn't do like he's wearing purple leather or something else dumb. Like, you have to put the Phantom in fucking purple spandex. Uh, th- I don't like certain aspects of it in that like the Phantom's costume in the movie has these weird little patterns on it, but they're so light that you it's fine. It's, it feels offer. like somebody at the studio was like, we got to fucking you. put a skull pattern on it. And it's like, oh, yeah. right, we put the fucking skull pattern on it, but you're not going to notice it. Like from a distance, he just looks like the fucking Phantom. Um, yeah. I also love like, you know, the, the Prisoner's my favorite TV show. And Patrick McGowan plays the Phantom, the 20th Phantom. So there's like a ghost Patrick McGowan. It's like a force ghost Phantom in the movie where Patrick McGowan's just like walking around being like, go fight cry. And Billy Zane's like, yes, father, I shall become a Phantom. Like, I, I love it. I don't love the way the movie's directed. It's pretty flat and kind of like, you want it to be Indiana Jones, and it's trying to be Indiana Jones, but it doesn't have the, like, sw- the sweeping kind of, it takes you off to another world energy. It has it has big uh, CBS pilot energy in terms of the directing. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, and, it just feels like Free Willy. Yeah, it feels like Free Willy. And also, like, the costumes and some of the casting is that way. Like, I feel like they got the casting half right. Like, Billy Zane, phenomenal. Patrick McGowan as the older Phantom, phenomenal. Catherine Zeta-Jones as an a- evil aviatrix, amazing. Treat Williams as a gangster? Mm, nah. And then, uh, fucking, what's his nut? The guy from The Warriors, Dexter's dad as evil Indiana Jones? No, you need... You need somebody with more character there. You need somebody who has more. Oh yeah, that guy. You know, more whatever his name pull. is. Yeah. Um. You the just you need you need something. Raiden from something. Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Yeah, exactly. Like you need that person to be somebody like a like a an equal leading man that's cool. You know, you want somebody that's like you want a, like a young Tom Selleck or a young Harrison Ford to be that character, but it it's just like character. Like honestly. Yeah, Michael Bean. Like, you want somebody like Michael Bean, right? That, that guy's um, like the poor man's Michael Bean. You know, he was originally cast to be in Aliens and then got kicked off because he got found with cocaine and they flew Michael Bean out to replace him. I mean, maybe he's the rich man's Michael Bean if he was just if he was just like caught with enough cocaine to get fired. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but, you know, so the and I feel like that I like the movie a lot. I love certain aspects of it. Um, but there's also some stuff in the movie that I'm like, guys, you were so close. You were so fucking close. And you just kind of made the bland version of it. Um, but I kind of don't even care about those aspects anymore. I just focus on like, like there's one shot where, yeah, where there's one shot where Billy Zane is like in the forest or the jungle or whatever. And there's this really iconic panel, the Phantom, where he's looking like that and he's got his arm up and they do a shot for shot recreation of that panel in the movie and it's like, yeah, that's great. That's exactly what it needed to be. That's wonderful. Fuck yeah. Do it. Do more of this. Yeah, and you can probably, you can like, I think you kind of have to thank for that, the perfect storm, well, the imperfect storm of the fact that this this dude who came off of this really successful family film just happened to be a very huge Phantom fan who like knew what he was kind of doing. Like I, I, like, I don't think this movie would have been anywhere near as good as it was if they hadn't have lucked out and they were just on hand, there was a dude who was like, what you need like a really safe, reliable studio director who can like turn in a, a movie that will do well. Uh, and also I happen to just be a huge Phantom fan like that. Like they just lucked out with that or they didn't look out with that. Cause I don't think the movie did particularly well, but in theory they should have looked no, out. No, but with in that. terms of the, but we looked out with that, I guess. Yeah. But in terms of we looked out with that. Yeah. Like, like I said, I wish it was a little bit more stylish and I wish it was, you know, a little bit kind of less stodgy and cooler. But 
I kind of feel like if you would have had, like, 90s lens flare, extreme shit from, you know, 96, like, that doesn't work with the Phantom. That's, that's bullshit. Um, so I'm, in some ways, I'm like, oh, I wish this had been just, like, one rung better. And in some respects, I'm like, man, I fucking love this movie. Billy Zane was originally signed up to do two sequels, but these were not made because of the disappointing ticket sales for the Phantom in theaters. In 2008, Paramount was considering creating a sequel to The Phantom, with Zane, Swanson, and Zeta-Jones returning in their roles. Instead of a sequel, a reboot of The Phantom was in the works, called The Phantom Legacy, to be produced by Bruce Sherlock, who was also an executive producer on the original Phantom. It would have been written by Tim Boyle. Sam Worthington was considered for the lead role. What do you think about that? You think Sam Worthington could have been The Phantom? Nah, no yeah. way. Yeah, I'm not into it either. Not, not a fan. Not a fan of Sam. Yeah. yeah, I'm not a Sam fan either. In 2014, plans for this film also fell through, with producer Mark Gordon instead attached to a different Phantom remake. I just realized one of the things I didn't include earlier was the sci-fi original two-hour movie that was the backdoor pilot for the Phantom TV show. Did you watch that? You're not missing anything. Basically, it was produced in like 2005 or six. and you want to guess what the, the big idea for the Phantom was? What if the Phantom did parkour? Well, that's that's kind of that's kind of a problem with this, right? Like that's why the movie kind of works because it's driven by the the director's like love for the for the property. Whereas like without that, the Phantom doesn't really have a thing that hasn't already been sort of done by Batman or whatever. Like bat like Batman in and as a movie, it like as the first movie that came out that did well like that, it it capitalized on a specific niche of that ends up becoming one of the biggest movie formats ever now with with the MCU and stuff like that. But the idea of like a costumed hero like fighting crime and like the fa- like the Phantom is kind of also that right. So there's like th- that that's I think that's the existential issue with the Phantom is that. It doesn't have a gimmick or like a hook. So that's where you have all these people trying to like inject really, all their little he, weird things into it. Which is funny because he absolutely does have a gimmick and a hook. It's just that gimmick and hook has been stolen by like a fuckload of characters in the hundred years since his creation. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of like it's I mean, it's not it's not one to one with this, but that that movie Knives Out came, came out and then like shortly after the movie came out, they were like, we're making a clue movie. And it's like, why? That, that That's just already what Knives Out is. It's just a clue movie already. It's kind of like that, where it's like, it's not that it's not that it doesn't have something. It's just like, it, it, it kind of missed a window. And then it's just like all these things that have been inspired by it have already come out and sort of like done that already. And then it's just like, where, where does this fit now? It's kind of like almost anachronistic. Yeah. Uh, needless to say, slam evil. Act three, the ghost who takes credit for other people's work. Probably. Life sometimes doesn't work out the way you want it to. Lee Falk, born Leon Harrison Gross, was a writer, theater director, and purported creator of the comic strips The Phantom and Mandrake the Magician. He was born on April 28, 1911, in St. Louis, Missouri. Born and raised in a Jewish family, his father died when he was just a boy. This is really interesting to me because I did not know this going in, and it kind of makes sense now. Like the whole idea of this 22 generations of un- can commitment to an idea of, you know, a strong link to these fatherly icons with the Phantom was created by somebody who grew up without a dad. Like that's really, really interesting to me. He changed his name to Lee, his stepfather's middle name, Falk, after leaving college. His brother Leslie did the same. Falk's early life in the comics was shrouded in theatrics. His initial bio claimed that he was an experienced world traveler and that he had studied in Eastern mystics. However, this wasn't the case. He was just someone from a small town in Missouri. Wait for it. Kayfabe. Kayfabe. So, you know, this is a perfect opportunity now for us to talk about all of the weird structurally racist shit in The Phantom. Because there's a lot of it. You know, The Phantom basically is a remix of the 
archetype of Tarzan, right, which was created by noted racist and white supremacist Edgar Rice Burroughs, um, who believed that you could put a man, a white man, anywhere in the world and he would come out on top. Even in the jungle, he would conquer the gorillas. And um, even on Mars, he would conquer the Martians. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of that stuff here where the Phantom is a dude, shows up on an island, and then he's like, oh, there's all these ignorant savages here. I guess I'll just teach them how to be cool and peaceful with one another. Like, pretty, it's pretty racist. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, the inherent, that's the inherent sort of conceit. I mean, we heard it in the serial, but the, you know, the inherent conceit is like, okay, so he washes up on this island... And he, be, you know, becomes their leader and teaches them to be at peace, which is just, you know, the implication of that is, number one, that these, like, indigenous people are inherently susceptible to being subjugated and, like, in need of some kind of leadership that they don't have. And number two are just, like, constantly warring and fighting and, you know, in this concept of savage savagery and it just took this dude washing up on the island to like be the the voice of reason to teach them to live in peace or whatever during world war ii he worked at kmox in st louis as the chief of propaganda which also makes sense when you're like oh he's trying to construct a kayfabe persona for himself he loves theater theatrics and is like you know, uh, changing his name and he's pretending like he's this person who studied Eastern mystics. And then the, you know, art form of the day that was the most commercially viable is comic strips. So he starts trying to get into comic strips and creates uh, the Phantom and Mandrake the Magician. Also, both two very theatrical people, right? Because the Phantom's whole thing is like, you can't tell that he's not his dad because he's wearing a costume. And like, you can't tell that Mandrake the Magician ain't Mandrake the magician because he's a fucking magician in a top hat. Hey, he loves magic. Yeah, Mike Mike Judge is a huge Phantom fan, and you know I'm just trying to see a god dang Phantom. <laughs> I'm just trying to see a god dang racially insensitive depiction of people from other countries. Speaking of which, I saw I saw that the like the teaser for the new Beavis and Butthead show, and I was just like, God damn it, like. I, I, I have Disney Plus. I have fucking HBO Max. I have Netflix. I did I never needed to get Paramount Plus. There was not anything on that that I cared about. Now I gotta get fucking Paramount Plus? Sick of this shit. I'm just trying to see a picture of a god dying butthead. It looks pretty good. I was I'm pretty excited about it. After being married three times and creating two wildly popular characters and being the cornerstone of the comic strip art form, Lee Falk still was unfulfilled for much of his life. His true passion was the theater. Surprise, surprise. Over the course of his life, he ran five theater companies, directed over 100 plays, and produced over 300. The two that he's most known for are Happy Dollar and an adaptation of his character, Mandrake the Magician. While running his, while running his theater, he worked with Marlon Brando, Charlton Heston, Basil Rathbone, Chico, Mac, Chico Marx, and Ava Gabor. Now we're going to watch this little clip of his daughter talking about what a stand-up kind of guy he was. Hi, I'm Valerie Falk. My father was Lee Falk, who is the tall, handsome gentleman in the picture behind me. The photo was taken at Castle Hill, uh, which is an, a local arts school and a place that fosters creativity. The man next to him is Sidney Simon, who is a fabulous sculptor, really wonderful sculptor. Um, my father wrote comic strips. He wrote Mandrake the Magician and the Phantom for over 60 years, actually, I think still the longest running strips done by their original creator. Um, but his first love was always theater. So he was very involved with all the arts. He was on the board and was the president of Castle Hill for several years um, and has and has stayed stayed summers in Truro for since from 1958 on every year from 1958 on um, it was a place that fostered his creativity and created many many deep friendships for a long time 
For all the years that my dad was doing the comic strips, his first love was really always theater. He wanted to be the great American playwright. He wrote quite a few plays, um, and some of them were reasonably successful. But what he really did was he ran summer theaters for many, many years, and a winter theater in Nassau and the Bahamas. And his theaters produced some pretty impressive things, including when they wanted to bring the Othello with Udo Hagen and uh, Paul Robeson from England to America, they were afraid to go straight to Broadway because they thought there might be race riots. It really was the first time that we know that uh, there was a really black Othello and a really white Desdemona. And so they brought the play to his theater in Cambridge because they thought there would be a sympathetic audience among the Harvard guys. They were all guys then. And in fact, that was true. Robeson was practically worshiped at that point. Um, however, there was a local bar that all the, the actors used to go to after the performances, and of course all the Harvard kids went too, because that's where you could hang out with them. And uh, the bar owner came to my father and said, I'm really sorry, Mr. Falk, but I can't let Mr. Robeson into the, into the bar. I mean, I would, it would ruin my reputation. I can't, I can't do it. And my dad said, that's fine, no problem. But my other actors will not go there from this play. And none of my actors will ever go to your bar again. And it's remarkable how fast the color line was broken. Uh, my dad actually used Xanadu as a center for a lot of things. And he, they would be fundraisers for various causes and, and political causes. One of his dearest, oldest. Yeah, so, you know, that's his daughter kind of hosting this event that's like a, you know, check out Lee Falk, this person who outside of my circles probably is barely remembered. Um, but I think the thing that's interesting about this is how did Lee Falk afford to put all these plays on? Because most cartoonists are really fucking poor. And the only thing you can do is just struggle to be a fucking cartoonist. <laughs> like you don't you don't have you don't have the existential headroom to have another desire usually when you're a cartoonist or a writer for comics. And it's interesting to me because Lee Falk is one of the few people who purportedly wrote and drew, and yet he only ever drew the first two strips or the first two weeks of strips for his comics so that he could own them, which is kind of shady. Uh, and in my opinion, I think uh, a little bit too coincidental. So basically, he, you know, taught himself how to draw, drew the first two weeks of Magic the Magician, did the first two weeks of Magic, and immediately hired an artist, which is just like, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. And then same thing with The Phantom. The Phantom first two weeks, so it can say created by Lee Falk. And then Ray Moore comes in after those first two weeks. And you're like, hmm, weird how the art doesn't really change all that much. Kind of seems to me like Ray Moore just got paid a bunch of money or, you know, a little bit more up front to ghost for those first two weeks with the promise of more work at the end of it. The ghost who writes. The ghost who writes. Um, so yeah, that's something I don't see anybody ever talking about that Lee Falk definitely used ghost artists because there's no drawing. Like he, he never drew again after those first two weeks. He never drew a strip. He never did convention sketches. There's, there's no drawings by him. There's no way he's an artist. There's just, there's just zero likelihood of this. Um, yeah, the, the narrative is like, oh, he, he taught himself to draw just because he was business savvy and wanted to do this to get the ownership of it and then after that he was done with it and he didn't actually have passion for drawing but you know any anybody who y y you know you think about it for three seconds and you realize like that's just that would just be impossible like there's no way that you could have that level of commitment to teach yourself to draw that well without it being an interest of yours or like like you couldn't just be like well done with that rote task that i only learned in order to gain ownership of these comic strips I'll never even doodle on a notepad again like that. That just wouldn't happen. Yeah. And I'll spend every waking moment and all of my money from the very lucrative comic strip that I write and created in air quotes, dumping it into the theater. Like that's just not that's not how people work. I don't buy it for a second. And it's something I don't ever see anybody talk about. You know, I, I never hear people championing Ray Moore. I never hear people championing and it might not have been Ray Moore. 
I don't know. Maybe it was a different artist. Um, but I never hear anybody even asking, like, did Lee Falk really draw this? Because no, no, he fucking totally didn't. Anyway, I uh, I just wanted to bring that up as we transition into the next phase of this episode, because I love the Phantom and I love the kind of mythology of the character. And I love the fact that it's still going today, almost 100 years after its creation, which I guess is a, a good transition into us talking about the next piece of the puzzle. Old dirty Halloween boy. Yeah, and it's a, it's a great segue because similar to Lee Falk, you are pretending like you drew this. It's true. But in rea- in reality, it was actually Debo, DeboVid18. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, DeboVid18 drew this. Um, yeah, so I'm, you know, I, I, I'm going to put out a book, which by the time you're listening to this, will be available for pre-order if you'd like to partake. Um uh, I put out a book called Halloween Boy. Um, I was in talks with King Features maybe about a year, year and a half ago to get the rights to the Phantom. And ultimately, it didn't quite come together. But I had to write all these pitch documents of what I would do with the Phantom. And after I finished the book that I have currently signed up with a publisher, I got really excited because I was like, you know, that last project took forever um, and almost fucking broke me. So I want to do something that's just kind of pure passion and with an emphasis on kind of productivity. So what what should I do? What should I kind of spend some time doing? And I kind of knew that I didn't really want to pitch. I didn't really want to deal with a publisher because I've been doing that a lot lately and it takes a lot of time and energy and you can always do that after the book is done. So I decided I want to self-publish something. I want to make something that's fully mine. I don't have to compromise on. I can make it exactly what I want it to be and I want it to be fueled by pure passion i don't want it to be calculated i don't want it to be i'm going to pitch something that i think i can get made i wanted to i wanted to shoot from the hip you know i wanted to make my version of a power cord in comics form and i was looking at all those documents that i wrote for the phantom and i was like oh you know what this is pretty fun like maybe i'll just take some of this stuff move it around and i'll evolve it into something new and i kind of was thinking of it like you know Darkman started because Sam Raimi wanted the rights to the shadow and couldn't get it. So Darkman happened. George Lucas wanted the rights to Flash Gordon. Couldn't get it. So made Star Wars. Made Red Tails. Yeah, he made Red Tails. Yeah. Um, so I was kind of looking at that and um, thinking about that and my passion for these old weird pulp characters and like, how do you, how could you do that and update it for today and hopefully take some of the structurally or overtly racist stuff out of it and how could you make it more inclusive and diverse and weird in a good way like uh you know more kind of like an art comic and so i started putting together halloween boy available now at heydavebaker.com it's true it is available for pre-order right now at heydavebaker.com andrew you've read it what do you think did i succeed did i fail what are your thoughts about halloween boy it's all right <laughs> what if this whole thing like leads up to this and then i'm just like eh. <laughs> well I, let me let me let me tell you this i read this thing and i was like all right it's got ridiculously detailed pages where like one page takes like 10 minutes to read check it's got characters with weird, nonsensical names that have nothing to do with what they are or any kind of internal logic. Check. There's like five or six typos in the book. <laughs> right. This is this is a Dave Baker joint. Yeah, yeah, for real. This is yeah, a I Dave, had to put it- Davey Boy and the Baker Streets joint. Yeah, I found a few of those after it went to print, and I was like, well, Fuck me. Uh, But I had to put this thing together like super quick to get it for San Diego. Like basically I finished lettering it and then the next day it went to print. And I only got one box in time for San Diego. I had to have my friend break into my apartment and drive down another box because I sold everything in that box. People really responded to it at the show. So I was very fortunate and that's cool. Um but aside from my penchant for typos, maybe that's not the best sales tool. Spam <laughs> maybe let's maybe let's talk about the book a little bit. Maybe the thematics it's of a, it. Maybe it's a it's a sales tool for my editing 
con- uh, consulting job. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. For spice consultants. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. So, uh, with l- similar to a lot of Dave's books, uh, Halloween Boy is is no exception. Um, uh, Dave's work tends to be... Um, he focuses on a lot of, like, really interesting um, mechanics that can only kind of exist in comic book form. Um, and I think that, you know, if you're, if you're somebody who doesn't read many comics, like, you have a very probably a very specific idea of what a comic is. Um, but there's like a lot more interesting things that you can do with comics. I mean, like normal comics are fine or whatever, but like the really interesting things that you can do with comics are things where like they couldn't even translate into a movie basically. Um, and so one of the, my, my favorite uh, part of the, of this book is, well, there's, there's kind of, there's, there's two parts of it that are my favorite. I think they're really emblematic of like the book itself and kind of the work that you tend to do. The first one is whenever he, whenever Halloween boy, well, so basically the, the, the central conceit of the book, you know, similar to the phantom, it's obviously very inspired by the phantom. We kind of get thrown into an adventure with Halloween boy. um, Like any good, like pulp or adventure narrative, you just kind of get thrown into like, this is a day in the life of this character so that you immediately just get like uh, calibrated with what, what this thing is and his dynamic with his, with his enemies and his sidekicks and his people that he's working with and how he fights and all these different things. Um, And so Halloween boy is in this like ancient ruin trying to recover this crystal. He runs across um, a couple of villains, so there's No Face and then uh, Frankenoid. No Face is this dude that's kind of like uh, whatever his name is, the Nazi guy from Indiana Jones, except for he just has no face. Uh, his face is just like this gross mass of like scar yeah, tissue, I guess. Like, it's bas- Yeah, his name is uh, King General Charlie No Face, and his eyes are teeth as well as his mouth is just made of teeth. And then his like the facial construction of his head is just all like weird veins and like fucked up, you know, scar tissue, basically. Yeah. And then Frankenoid is like a giant Frankenstein head with arms and legs. Um, yeah, and later and later on, we find out he's some kind of like clone of this like race of soldiers Um they're they're in the same place. They're using this slave girl named carry on is that how you pronounce it i yeah uh she she can like control little animals and like make them do things like control like biomass basically with her mind they're trying to get her to do something and then halloween boy basically interrupts this with his his rest his uh mission to find this crystal um he's riding a giant feathered dinosaur named uh saber I almost said Spectre. Um, and uh, it was funny, funny enough, whenever at the beginning, like we see, we see Saber and then he's like, go wait in the ship. And I was like, what the hell? Like, you're just going to show this dinosaur and then they're just going to go away. Um, but, it, but it comes, it, it, we, it, there's a, there's a, we, the checkoff's gun gets fired later. So it's all good. Um, he saves the, I don't want to r- ruin the whole book, but he, he saves the, the, the slave girl. And then, they have this action sequence. Um, I'm not going to tell any more of the plot. You know, you can read the book yourself. But basically, after that, they go back to this this race of aliens that he was recovering the crystal for, and the crystal, I guess, gives them back their memories. And they do this sort of ancient ritual to sort of imbibe of their generational memories, and they invite him to be a part of the ritual. And so there's this big splash page where um, he he. Um, participates in this ritual and it opens up this huge uh, well of past memories and things from things from his past that he hasn't unlocked. And it's this big splash page where you have like all of these, like literally like 50, 60, a hundred, I don't know how many tiny little panels sort of floating in this abyss. And each one of them is like a little random memory. And then you have this, uh, this um, eye opening mechanic that's overlaid on top of that where his eyes are like slowly opening over these hundreds of memories that are sort of like blasting into his head 
and it's this it's a it's a it's a uh, one page splash where you have just all this like hyper detail and you can just kind of sit there pouring over it and um it's it's not like it's not like hundreds of panels telling some kind of specific linear story it's more of a a big tapestry or a mosaic that's kind of like conveys like an emotion which i think is like something that you do a lot um and then the other panel that is a similar thing is towards the end when he gets blasted i I, honestly i was a little confused about what happened at the very end which i think is supposed to be a little ambiguous but at the very end of the book once again i don't want to spoil anything but something happens and then a similar thing happens where he gets like these memories unlocked in his mind and it's a similar splash page where he's kind of like floating in an abyss and then you see like a bunch of like i guess alternate dimension versions of him so it's just like a bunch of different halloween boys from a bunch of different dimensions they're all wearing slightly different costumes or whatever it's a similar thing where it's like really hyper detailed um but it's not really like oh like you have to look and see in this like all the story happening it's more of a just like a general it's like a painting that like when you look closely it's got a little a bunch of details but then you can kind of zoom out and then get this larger effect um and i feel like that's like really signature of what you do um with these books and so it's like that kind of juxtaposed with like very kind of like arch pulp tropes um and those two things like together are really interesting because it could be you know there's another there's another book which you actually did a cover for that i like called atomic robo and atomic robo is like it's like a pure like pastiche of pulp adventure care uh stories but like to the point where it's like it's just exactly copying that format and i like the book well enough i've read a bunch of the books but like after a while you just kind of get tired of it because you're just like ah. Eh. It's just like a robot guy and he's like a pulp adventure, Indiana Jones type character. And you get it like after a while, you kind of fucking get it. Um, whereas this is like, you know, it, it, it completely switches up the format to where the, it's it's like the, the pulp tropes are just sort of a baseline. And then there's this really interesting sort of like postmodern thing sitting on top of it that can only exist inside of a comic book um, because you just couldn't even do this in, in a movie like they kind of tried to do this with doctor strange and it just didn't work yeah i mean the you know the the kind of backstory of the character is that you know he's this he's raised on this island basically this floating island in lower orbit which we we see in the book like it's his base hades island and it's a giant floating skull city that's like above the earth in lower orbit and um he he basically is like a a pulp adventurer who's whole kind of modus operandi is that he only helps people in impossible situations so if you're in a no-win scenario he'll come in and help you uh but if you're in something you can get yourself where was he when i tried to take over as co-host of this show (laughs) exactly exactly so you know we learn in the in the back half of the issue like that he has this kind of backstory where he was raised by computers on this island and didn't know anyone and didn't have a name for much of his life and then when he was about six years old he was presented with a no-win scenario where he was given he was brought into this little room by the computers that raised him and there's a dog in front of him which at that point was like the only thing he ever wanted all he'd always heard about dogs he'd never seen one he always wanted a dog as a pet and there was a dog there and the computer's like you have to kill this dog now and he's like what no i'm not gonna kill a dog and they're like if you don't kill this dog there's a room on the other side of the island that has people in it and they're going to be killed. So he like finds a way to f- defeat this no win scenario and he kind of like wins in air quotes. And as the computer is like sputtering out, it's like, congratulations, you are n- now code name Halloween boy. And uh, hmm, I, wonder, no, I, wonder that- how, I wonder how that would sound if we uh, pitched it down by two semitones yeah i wonder and i wonder and, i wonder and added a, uh, a a chorus effect and a auto-tune effect yeah i wonder i, I don't know I, I probably pretty cool probably um so the you know the 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 story like kind of follows him as he is kind of trying to work through this trauma of like being raised away from people and like his way of trying to give back to the world is by helping people and trying to connect with them again and 
Sometimes that's, you know, going to far off alien worlds and rescuing crystals. And sometimes it's, uh, you know, participating in like civil uprisings and, and being a part of like, uh, you know, rebellions in, in other lands and whatnot. Um, and yeah, so he, he, like you said, at one point in the story, he brings this crystal that unlocks the memory of this alien race. And they're like doing this big kind of religious ceremony, which humans aren't supposed to be able to interact with. Like the crystals don't have any effect on most other aliens other than this specific alien race that are composed of crystals. And so they like touch the crystal to his forehead and it like unlocks all these memories of like genetic memories of his past familial lineage that he didn't know. And uh, at the end of the book, you know, they, they complete the mission. He brings this Carrion character who's like an alien uh, back to his mansion or not mansion. Uh, well, I guess there is a mansion, but it's like a, you know, this floating island. And he's like, hey, I feel like maybe we're friends now. Do you want to come hang out with me on my weird floating island? And she's like, I don't have anywhere else to be. Just please get me out away from these alien slaver assholes. So they go to this place and he like, at the, at the end of the day is like fucking around with the crystal looking at it because they give him a shard of it and it like something about the way that his brain is wired because he on this island there it's fueled by these giant brains called titan brains so like the center of the island is three like two ton brains and that psychic energy is what keeps the entire island floating and running and like he appears to have some sort of latent psychic ability too in the comic. Like he does some psychic stuff at one point, um, but it's obviously like not trained or he doesn't know how to use it. And so he has some sort of connection with this crystal that at the end of the book, it like kind of floats up in the air, touches his forehead and unlocks more of those memories, which is the the thing you were talking about of this big double page splash of all these weird floating previous Halloween people. Um and we'll learn more about who those people are and how they relate to the story and him as the book goes on, you know, in, in the second and third and fourth issue. Um, but yeah, I kind of wanted to just make something that's like a a remix of those tropes. But like you said, do it in like a fresh, weird, avant-garde, almost kind of like art comic way. So it it is like two-fisted fighting motherfuckers with dinosaurs and shit. But it's also just like a meditation on loneliness and like being away from your family and not having institutionalized familial knowledge, you know? Yeah. And the the interesting thing, and it's like, I feel like this is like how all your books are and this is like no different, but like the, you know, the difference between like these pulp comics, the original ones like the Phantom and then these other things that are sort of like almost a, you know, a, a pastiche or like an intentional throwback to it, like Atomic Robo is like the things, the things that you do are like always like zoomed way out like every like they feel like we're looking at like little like models in a diorama as opposed to you know being really zoomed in and everything's like close-up action shots and whenever somebody punches somebody it's like a really dynamic cinematic type of of panel that's showing like the front and like a really cool like something you could use in in a thumbnail or you could make it the cover of something or whatever really like cinematic type artwork and uh this book and you know most of your other books that you draw they almost feel like you you're zoomed out and you're kind of looking at like you're 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 looking at at things from like a like an aerial view where you can where you kind of like it it conveys that that loneliness and that space to where you know when you're zoomed in you're like oh the phantom is this hero guy you know he's a, he's a swashbuckler and he goes around fighting bad guys and then you zoom out and then you just see that he's like alone and that and you just notice how lonely he is and how much space there is around him and how far away he is from everybody else. And it's just that simple like zooming out that creates that effect. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I think a lot of the books I make for multiple reasons are like these weird personal metaphors, you know, that I don't think most people even need to get. Like it's it's me writing about something mostly just for me. And, you know, these last two years. I, hot take has been a little rough bro like you know all these motherfuckers out here by themselves and i think that that stuff affected me too in you know in looking at some of these archetypal characters of kind of like the burden of power right because they're power fantasies a lot of these 
characters. You know, Doc Savage, The Shadow, Rocketeer, Superman. You know, they're all by themselves, really. Like, sure, they have a supporting cast, but Superman especially is super lonely. Like, that, if you really think about it, like, he doesn't, he doesn't have anybody to talk to. He doesn't have anybody that understands his experience. And that's really the the lesson of Superman is the power of empathy is that even through that loneliness, he's able to still connect with humans. He's able to still see the good in them. Yeah. And, and when, when you're, when you're zoomed in on these, on these people and these moments and these actions, you're focused on what they're doing and the things that they're accomplishing and sort of their effect on the world. But when you zoom out, you become aware of the, of the sort of negative space all around them. And you're like, Oh, while they're doing those things, that we are like super zoomed in on they're actually just very alone and very very uh it's just there, there's there's just a lot of nothing around them i just that's that's the thing that really jumps out to me about some of these panels in this book yeah uh that's really cool to hear i hadn't thought of it in those terms but i think that that's totally right on you know thematically in in time with what i'm doing um and yeah you know i kind of wanted to just like take a lot of those tropes and not ground them in the way that like a movie would ground them where it's like and now we've got to fucking know where his suit comes from why is his suit purple like i hate that shit yeah it's not it's not the christopher nolan like what's the real life version of this it's like let's take these larger than life characters and like inject small but huge emotions into it yeah exactly it's about you know the it's like the, the the cost of doing it all, right? So it's like, you know, the the moment where you're after you've just defeated the Nazi horde, you're back at your secret lair and you're like trying to unwrap your knuckles and your like knuckles are just fucking broken and you have to like figure out how to set them because there's no one else there to do it. Like you're just like, fuck, how do I like close my hand after this? Um and yeah, I think the you know, I'm pretty excited about how the book came together. Um I'm pretty excited about the kind of evolution or movements, you know, uh, in my art that happened. I feel like I learned some things and I feel like even if I didn't draw it, I would look at some of that stuff and think, oh, that's really cool. Like there's one shot of a dinosaur in the book that I'm like, yeah, I I would think that's really fucking cool if I opened this book and saw this dinosaur eating this fucking like henchman guy. Like that's really fucking cool. Although I thought it was really funny that that came directly after him convincing carry on or carrion that she shouldn't kill these guys that enslaved her because it wouldn't make her feel any better. It's like, but, but the dinosaur will though. Like that's fine. <laughs> the dinosaur, he's a fucking monster. Like he'll, he'll, he's going to murder these guys. You don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. The dinosaur who has a talk box around his neck and seems to be somewhat sentient. Like he seems to be like capable of intelligent thought. He'll just fucking eat him. It's cool. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just he'll 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 just eat him. It's fine. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that the uh, I think the fun. I think that's I think that's another thing about it too. Is like I look at the pages and I think you can see me having fun drawing it. You know, like you can feel that in pages when somebody's like on a deadline and they're like, I don't think I want to do this shit anymore. But you know, working on this book, especially because I was trying to emphasize speed. Um, you wouldn't know it from looking at the fucking pages because of how detailed they are. But I really was trying to speed things up and move through the process quicker and really emphasize productivity over laborious, refining, redrawing everything over and over again, you know? Yeah, and the 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 one thing, going back to the sort of like subverting the sort of like imperialist racial thing, it, it was interesting because looking at reading the book, I realized that it's like a very, it's a very like simple trick that's being done to subvert that. Um, it's like a very small change and it's kind of similar to what they did with Mad Max Fury Road. And it's essentially the one change in the dynamic of the hero character, the phantom Halloween boy that subverts that trope of like white man goes into a like non-white uh, world and immediately dominates it is like moving the character from being like into a supporting role like Halloween boy when he interacts with other alien races um, he he's not like a domineering like I'm here to save the day like he's a support he's he's a support 
um, he's there to support things. He's there to lift up what people are already doing. And I think that's like the conceit of like helping people out of impossible situations. He's not like barreling in and like taking control and um, being the literal white savior. He is um, he's he's offering a support role that augments what they're already doing and in in uh, in that process helps them out of their impossible situation. It's a very simple difference that that completely subverts that in an in- interesting way. That's the goal. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that it it worked uh, for you because, yeah, adventure comics just inherently are racist. Like they yeah. just are inherently racist. Yeah. And it, so, it, just, it, re- it reminded me of, of Fury Road because that's like that's the little trick that that George Miller does where he's like, yeah, I feel like if I made this movie that's all about these women that are trying to escape this like weird like pregnancy cattle farm and if mad max was like this hero dude who was like coming in to like save them that would just feel really weird and it would feel kind of condescending so instead mad max is just like a sidekick now and he's just basically just like facilitating furiosa's call a uh, call to adventure and that that completely changes the dynamic of it yeah totally um and also Max as a character works best when he's put upon in an environment, right? When he's backed into a corner. Um, and, you know, I think also too, like the goal with Halloween Boy was to tell thematically like the story of somebody's first friendship. You know, like I don't necessarily know how old he is, but he seems like he's at least late 20s, early 30s. And like Loki, he lives alone on a fucking island with like a Frankenstein headed weird clone soldier and a talking dinosaur and he doesn't have any friends he doesn't do anything other than work and over the course of these four issues carrion is going to help him unlock that side of himself and start using his resources for good in ways that he wasn't initially thinking like uh, you know i don't know if you've got a giant floating base and you're like rescuing people from like slave traders and like weird uh you know indentured servitude situations or like you know situations where governments aren't treating people well why not have them fucking stay on the island with you you know like (laughs) spoiler alert there's going to be more people that live on hades island other than just halloween boy by the time the book's done um and that's kind of a you know a visual representation of his emotional growth over the course of the book um it kind of makes you wonder what's what's going on in zero's chest pocket dimension are they like are they like forming like a society in there are they hanging out is it like have they created like an internal government? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Um, that, that, but y- that feels like it might come up someday in the future. And be, Maybe. Be a, be, a, be a problem. Might be. Who knows? Who knows? Not me. Uh, but yeah, if all of our yammering about Halloween Boy sounds interesting to you, uh, you can find copies on my website, heydavebaker.com. Uh, I'm going to have the pre-orders open for probably another week. I put, honestly... Went to San Diego, sold basically every copy I had, put what copies I didn't sell there online on Monday, sold those out in like two hours, which I was shocked at. So I put up a pre-order link and I'm going to do another printing. Um, I'm going to keep it open probably for the the rest of the week. So if you are interested in reading the book or also there's an end essay uh, that's all about kind of my love of the Phantom and James Bama Doc, Doc Savage paintings and... Um, yeah, I'm I'm pretty proud of the book. I think it came out really well. And um yeah, I'm I'm excited about it. Any any final thoughts, Spandrew, about either The Phantom or Halloween Boy? Uh yeah, I guess I guess I guess uh ultimately my question from the very beginning of the episode of like, you know, which which world do you want to live in? Do you want to live in a world where you are sort of like creating these formative um characters that will become the arch tropes that will be, you know, serve as inspiration for decades to come? Or do you want to live in sort of postmodern society where you have to build, uh, build on what has come before in, in these really like hyper specific ways in order to stand out? Um, and it was, it was a bit of a loaded question because I think that, um, you know, the, the Halloween boy is kind of an example of how, those two things are sort of like symbiotic and, and um, you know, it's uh, m- maybe not in other ways for sure, but specifically 
when it comes to creating things. Um, it's possibly the greatest time to be alive so far because um, the tools for creating and distributing um, art are, you know, the barrier for entry is incredibly low. Things are very inexpensive. It's, it's really cheap um, compared. I mean, I'm, I'm, there are certain, there are still some people who don't have access to these things. And I think that that's, we still have a ways to go in that, but things are, it's, it's cheaper than ever to create things and be able to distribute them to people. Um, and we have immediate access to a lifetime's worth of, of, um, of content and inspiration. The fact that you can just go onto YouTube and look at Billy Zane's wig, like in a second, like as funny as like that joke is, or laughing about that earlier, like, you know, 15 years ago, you wouldn't have been able to do that. You would have had to go and buy the DVD of 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 the Phantom and like specifically go to that chapter and like fast forward it. Like that seems like such a stupid little thing. But like it's 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 just it's crazy that you can just be like wig scene, YouTube dot com Phantom wig scene. I mean, that's give not me that really. wig. Give me that wig. And, and the way that you can do that in, in all regards, like all of the, you know, visual reference for comics and rewatching a scene to like study its composition and how it went together. Like we are just in a, like I said, not in many other ways, but specifically when it comes to creating art, we are in like a creative utopia of the infinite possibilities of how you can be inspired, create and give your art to people. Um, and this is just like a perfect example of that pipeline. I agree. Uh, please go by Halloween boy. Thank you. Bye. I'm Dave Baker. I'm Spandrew Spice. If you'd like to find me online, you can do so at heydavebaker.com where you can find books like Halloween boy. Spandrew, where can people find you on the internet? You can't find me on the internet because I don't use social media, but if you want to pay your respects to the dear beloved Papa Pricey, you can go to heydavebaker.com and get Halloween Boy because it it's what Andrew would have wanted. And uh, you can also find us at uh, on Facebook, search Deep Cuts Podcast. You can join our Facebook group, search Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group. We talk about the show and make memes. You can join our Discord server, bitly.com slash Deep Cuts Discord, uh, where we talk about the show, and make memes, and also talk about other vaguely related stuff. You can follow us on Instagram at Deep Cuts Pod. You can go to our shop, uh, by going to deepcutspod.com and clicking on the shop and you can get t-shirts, hats, fanny packs, baby onesies with cool Deep Cuts graphics on them. You can also pick up our um, Mystery Treehouse Junior Sleuth shoulder patches by going to deepcutspod.com. And um, once again, I'll just say, uh, I don't know how long I can keep saying this because um, eventually they'll sell out, but we have like four or five of the simple code tape comics left um that i still have in stock so if you buy one now you'll be able to get a tape relatively soon for anybody who's ordered one of these which there there are a couple of people who have um i've been out of town on a really long road trip and uh i haven't been able to get back to my house to ship these out but they'll be shipped out very soon because i'm starting to head back west um but uh, yeah, once once these four or five last copies are sold out, uh, we probably won't order more unless there's some surge in demand for them. Um, so you only have a couple more chances to get your hands on this tape. Deep Cuts is a production by Boy Genius Media. If you'd like to find this show and others like it, please visit boygeniusmedia.com or deepcutspod.com. If you want to join in on post-episode discussions, please join the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group. Finally, subscribe to our YouTube channel for additional video content.